Okay, good afternoon everyone and welcome to the Binalo Talks. So I can see that there's a lot of new people here. Yung Binalo Talks, just for everyone's information, is a, talks, a weekly talks during lunchtime, 12 p.m. to 1 p.m. Uh, that we usually do in the, archae uh, in the Archaeological Studies program in UP Diliban. Uh, it doesn't just focus on archaeology, uh, it focuses on a lot of things. Uh, but uh, we try to be integrative, integrative. Sorry, in uh, in in the topics. So because of the pandemic, we moved the talks to online, and of course we went crazy, inviting people who we think we can contribute a lot to the study of archaeology. So, but of course we're not just limited to archaeology. So as you may know, so welcome. If you have any questions, I you can uh, private message me, I'm Anna, or you can also private message Ara, her username is AMSPGAR, or if you have any questions, you can also press the raise your hand button, uh, and then we will call you so you can unmute. But in the meantime, we will uh, listen to the lecture. Uh, and the lecturer is one of our graduate students and will be introduced by another of our another graduate student of ours. So can we call on Miss Fai Bangahan? Hi. Am I audible? Yes. Okay. So hello everyone. I'm Fai Bangahan. I am a master student in the archaeology archaeological studies program. And I'm delighted and honored to be invited to introduce our Benalot speaker today. So our guest speaker is an assistant professor of history in the School of Multidisciplinary Studies in the De La Salle College of St. Daniel. So he obtained his master's degree in history at the De La Salle University in Manila. And he recently completed his diploma in archaeology at the University of the Philippines Diliman under the Archaeological Studies program. So on top of his academic achievements, he is also a visual artist. And if you have ever heard of Manila for a day and have been fortunate enough to experience their intramuros tours and by buying courses, his name is for sure familiar. So here today to share his discourse on a historical and historic iconography, please welcome Jose Alain Austria. Thank you very much, Fai. Anna, is it clear? Okay, loud and clear? Yes, you're good. Okay, thank you very much. Now, it's a very stormy afternoon to all of you, okay? Uh, right at this very moment, we are actually in the middle of a week-long celebration for um, the festivities of the Virgin of Solitude of Cavite. So if ever there are Caviteños here, be they Chabacanos or Tagalogs, a happy fiesta to all of you. The past couple of years is marked with a renewed sense of fascination for this small painting. You, need, you see the icon of Nuestra Señora de la Soledad de Portavaga, or Our Lady of Solitude of Portavaga, is no ordinary 17th century painting. Mary, as represented in the icon, is the Virgin of Predilection or patroness of both Cavite City and the whole province as well. When Pope Francis wrote the Bull of Canonical Coronation last 2018, the Catholic Church officially recognized the image as miraculous and the popular devotion to it okay, is imbued with an authentic spirit through the centuries. For, the, for those who are viewing it from the religious point of view, this is the highest possible honor given to a venerable object of devotion, be it a statue or uh, a painting or a print. A year before this, the Republic of the Philippines designated the painting as a national cultural treasure. 
cultural heritage enthusiasts will find it interesting that apart from the frame image, the intangible cultural traditions associated with it are considered to be treasures too and to be preserved. The state recognition establishes the icon as one of extreme importance, not just for Caviteños, but the Philippines as a whole. The state and the church, normally separated, is in unison in giving its highest honors to this diminutive picture. Now, some people believe that this, the fact that it is the oldest uh, so far dated painting known in the Philippines, at least of the Virgin Mary, is its only claim to secular fame. You know, future researchers may uncover other Marian paintings much older than the Puerto Vaga icon, and some feel if that happens, the Soledad will lose its niche and in Philippine sacred art history. I personally disagree. The national treasure status is not a contest of being the oldest or the first. Nor can I say that the canonical coronation of a Virgin, the Virgin Mary's image is some sort of a beauty contest to the fairest image of them all. If you think in this manner, then you unfortunately miss the point. The Virgin of Porta Vaga is one rare piece of sacred art that mysteriously functions as a window to heaven, thus the term an icon, and has transcended this religious function to become a real cultural icon. It is the rallying symbol of the Capitenos and the smaller Chabacano community, one of their few remaining tangible con uh, connections with their past. If Our Lady of Peña Francia or Ina is intrinsically linked to the Bicolano soul or the Guadalupe to the Mexican people, so is the Soledad de Portavaga to the Capitenio. It is an image of the best of what their rich heritage has to give and both the church and the state give it a formal thumbs up. Despite this rather large number of accolades, local studies, and documentaries on the Soledad of Cavite, you know, there is still room for new and broader perspectives. Let's try to consider it from a new lens. Have we ever considered the fact that the image is not an original? but a copy, probably just one of hundreds that still survive around the world, a copy of the original Nuestra Señora de la Soledad in Madrid. Have we ever considered that it is possibly an image of a dynamic nature? It's a work of art that is constantly evolving and changing because of popular piety and because of the so-called aesthetics of pious clutter. Did we ever consider looking into the possibility that the image is a catalyst of an entirely unique and Filipino way of imagine, imagining the Sorrowful Virgin? This talk aims to look at the Porta Vaga and its place in the much bigger narrative of sacred art, both in the Hispanic world and in the Philippines. Our Lady of Solitude's icon the original prototype, was the brainchild of Isabel Valois, the third wife of King Philip II of Spain. Reminded of the subdued beauty of French Madonnas, she commissioned a sculptor, Gaspar Becerra, to create a fully polychromatic sculpture of the Virgin meditating on the Passion of Christ. She is to be called the Virgin of Solitude, Soledad, for on the night of Good Friday, she was totally alone. She is a widow, the husband is dead, the son is dead, and she is at that time meditating on the harrowing events that happened before her eyes. As it was first conceived, this new statue of the Virgin Mary, which was intended to be in full color, blue, red, and what have you, consciously breaks from the Spanish tradition of melodramatic, anguish-filled, tearful Mater Dolorosas. You know, they call this the, the telenovela style Mater Dolorosa, where everything is in, you know, she's always in anguish and in tears. And this was replaced by something that is more subdued, something that is more calm. Now, this fact alone 
makes the image quite revolutionary at that time. Now, but it was the intervention of a lady in court, a countess, uh, Maria de la Cueva, the Countess of Uredia, that transformed the Becerra masterpiece into a novelty. You know, a widow herself, the Countess insisted that to achieve the simple but very dignified effect so favored by the Council of Trent and the Counter-Reformation, the, statu the statue should be dressed in the robes of a widow, and take note of this, a widow of the Habsburg court. In short, she wanted the virgin to be dressed in the same clothes as herself and other widows of the nobility like her. In this historical painting uh, in Madrid, the baptism of Prince Fernando, son of Philip II, you will notice in that red square, within that square, women who look like nuns. Now, for the record, they are not nuns. They are members of the royal family who happen to be widows, or at least some of them are old maids. They are dressed in mourning robes called de luto, which is actually like panlamay or panluksa na kausuutan nila at the time. It is similar to the habit of nuns since it is also the reminder to the widow, particularly if she's elderly, that she is expected to behave like a contemplative religious, even at the heart of the El Escorial and all those palaces. As a widow, she must dedicate herself to religious endeavors, just like a nun. In fact, number 24 there, this one is Princess Juana. So she's, she looks like a nun, but she's actually a widowed royalty. Now, this photograph shows to you the final product. Because of the con Countess's intervention, they have to put textile on it. So it's a simple but novel visage of the Soledad. Unfortunately, the original statue was destroyed during the Civil War. As you see, it is a very simple and very, it is very minimalist. It is a very concrete statement against the Spanish practice of treating Marian images like a doll or like a celestial mistress. So there's a saying that goes that more mother than a queen, Mary shuns the crown. So here, the image is really an instrument of prayer not some sort of a heavenly fashion show of sorts. Now, after its completion, the image was entrusted to a particular group of friars, the Orden de Frailes Minimos, or what we call the Minim Friars of St. Francis of Paula. She was enshrined at their convent in Madrid called La Victoria. Thus, the formal title given to the image is Nuestra Señora de la Soledad de la Victoria. This was designated to be the official shrine of the Soledad in the world. Now, the Padres Minimos, or the friars, in turn, were given two distinct tasks. First, they must promote devotion to this title and image of Mary. That's very, very obvious. Second, they should police the devotees and the artists to ensure that the devotion and the image is understood by the people as the crown and the church sees proper or intended to be. Now, this is still very much during the time of the Spanish Inquisition. So even Catholics can be suspects for whatever tendencies they have. So orthodoxy is so important, even in pictures. So you could see in this diagram that the, it illustrates the, the twofold responsibility of the order of Frailes Minimos. The question now is, were they successful? I think they succeeded in promoting the Soledad devotion, which really flourished in Castile between the mid 16th to the 18th centuries. However, they failed to curtail the enthusiasm of the Spanish people. There were shrines that were created without the consent of the convent of the Victoria. And this at times even reached the civil courts. So, yup they did have legal cases filed against devotees and artists whom they feel deviated from the guidelines of, laid by the royal family and uh, 
you know, the, the flyers themselves. So in hindsight, the order of minims were instrumental in creating at least a canon for the artistic depiction of the Becerra statue. That explains why Castilian copies, be it paintings or prints, consistently show the same pictorial elements. But you know, once the Soledad enters Latin America and the Philippines, the subdued black and white Madonna all of a sudden turned into a burst of color. Here are four Spanish grabados, prints, engravings, what have you. We call them estampas or estampitas here. These prints represent at least four patterns or templates which are typical of the type of art that is approved by the royal family and the order of minims. Pattern A is a full altar view, a more realistic rendition of the actual retablo of the Virgin at La Victoria Convent. Pattern B shows the Virgin in procession. Now, you know why the Virgin's head is always tilted to the left? In its early days, in fact, up to the 1930s, an empty cross with the instruments of torture were actually placed to the left of the Virgin to show that the Soledad is meditating on the passion of the yet-to-be-resurrected Christ. So the proper time to process the Soledad is from 3 p.m. of Good Friday up to Holy Saturday, just before the Easter service. You will notice that below these so-called uh, images, there are banners that are placed at the bottom of the pictures. These are proper descriptions addressed to the viewer that he or she is looking at. Take note, a certified true copy of the image of the Virgin of Soledad of La Victoria. You should not forget to highlight the words verdadero retrato, a true copy or a true picture, and the Victoria. So this is like having a copyright and an intellectual property right for a religious devotion as early as the 16th century. Pattern C introduces the elements that we will later see in the Philippines, curtains and candles. But of relevance to us Filipinos is pattern D. Pattern D, which you see in the right, is a, that is a case, in that case, a print from La Rioja, although there are other uh, variants of this, truly captures the attention of many of us. Now you see a close-up of the statue, but in a smaller table altar. There are only two candles, the left and the right. You see a close-up of the statue, and it is a very intimate picture. In pattern D, the Soledad is very, very close to the viewer. So this type of depiction is most appropriate for a home altar. It is precisely for domestic use. Now, if you look at paintings, it seems that pattern D will become the norm. There are two paintings that you see here. The one to the left tends to be very naturalist in its style. And these are the type of images that can be seen in churches, etc. That's one option. The one that is more popular because it's used in homes, is the one to your right, which is basically pattern D in oil. Now, for some reason, painters are allowed to add or take away minor elements from pattern D, but they should always remember the two important elements. The Virgin Mary should be there, and definitely the curtains should be there. Remember those two details, Virgin Mary, curtains. Virgin Mary, curtains, small format. That will make sense as we move on. Geography and trade would play a major role in the iconographic transformation of both the icon and the devotion to the Soledad. As Spanish copies of the image, and most of them are two-dimensional because statues are so expensive to, you know, board the galleons. So it's better to do, you know, two-dimensional stuff. 
before they reached the, by the time they reached the americas it was met with such enthusiasm and creativity far from spain la victoria and even the minimos friars and there's not much of them in the philippines and the new world local artists began to develop their own solidarities according to their own image so not only that there are shrines that began to sprout out of the blue which are independent from la victoria so the devotees in the new world were known to be very very passionate if not almost fanatic in their piety during the process of all this trading and traveling three very popular shrines develop apart from la victoria to be honest la victoria although it's popular as an art you know as the center of the devotion it never really reached the level of what we call popular devotion so it's ironic that the one containing the copies are more popular now among these we have the great shrine to nuestra señora de soledad of oaxaca in mexico which is actually a very unusual version and much later in the 18th century, actually later than the one in Cavite, you have the Virgen de la Soledad de la Paloma. You know, she's not Our Lady of the Dub. She happens to be found in Calle La Paloma, Madrid. So they, that's why they call her La Paloma, okay? And of course, you have our very own Porta Vaga in the list. What's interesting about this tree is that all of them and their cults develop without any deliberate attempt to create a popular cult. This brings home one important message. Popular devotions are organic. They cannot be or nor deliberately be invented. It's just like the Nazareno. Bigla na lang sumulpot. May ibang Nazareno sa Intramuros. There's a Nazareno in Quiapo. And then why is it the one that Quiapo that sparked devotion? It's very complex to explain. It's spontaneous and it is something that's very, very archetypal. You don't plan it uh, consciously. Now, once you enter to the Americas, there's also a change in the way the Soledad is being depicted. When a Spanish icon meets the indigenous traditions of the Americas, the somber Soledad suddenly turned into a fiesta of loud colors and folk idioms. Consider, for example, the Soledads of the Guatemalan school, who are always depicted as rather plump women, medyo chubby sila lagi. And they have Native American features. Remember, Guatemala has a predominantly Native American population. And her robes are now decorated with very, very ornate patterns. Flowers, leaves, stars, etc. When you consider the Virgin in Peru, particularly the Cusco school, you will notice that artists do not hesitate to match red and gold with her morning robes. In sabi nga nila, you know, naglulok sa ka, pero nakapula ka. That's unusual, but not in Peru. I mean, let's, let's go for it. I mean, that's nice. So instead of instruments of torture, you will also, also notice that the Peruvian Soledad is meditating on roses and vases. And of course, our dear Mexico, don't you just love the playful, whimsical compositions of the Mexicans? You know, the artist couldn't care less if the color scheme is canonically correct. If you look at the Mexican school Soledad, you will see God the Father on top, placing the crown on her head. You see those self-conscious angels holding the candles. So you see biblical chronology and artistic logic is swept away by the Mexican desire to play. Now, it is the hypothesis of this talk that what happened in Latin America also happened in the Philippines. At the height of the galleon trade, Cavite served as the main port of entry for Spanish ships flying the Manila Acapulco trade. Now, the galleons arrived and disembarked precisely in this walled port town, a mini intramuros of sorts. As an international port, it is very probable that copies of the Soledad from Spain or the Americas actually reached the Philippines via Cavite Puerto much earlier, probably in the 1570s, 1580s, 1590s. Now, oral tradition, however, prefers a more dramatic arrival, not just it came via trade. According to oral tradition, 
the Virgin Mary dressed in black and white robes appeared to a Guardia Civil in what is now Porta Vaga Gate. Um, this one. And she's demanding to be allowed entrance into that gate so that she could enter the town of Cavite. Now, in the story, the Virgin gently reprimanded the Guardia Civil for not recognizing his mother, quote-unquote. Then she disappeared. The next day, the workers at the naval yard in Cavite suddenly discovered a painting that is floating on the seas. And the people in Cavite, most more likely the Spanish ones, realized that, hey, this is familiar. This is Our Lady of Soledad. So they got it. There are miracles that happened. And the rest, as they say, is pious history. If we consider the oral tradition as historical fact, it is understandable now why most Cavitenos call the Soledad the Porta Vaga. Because the Virgin Mary appeared in front of this particular gate to the old town. Later on, they erected a church, uh, a hermitage, for the picture beside the wall of the old town. But unfortunately, both historical structures were destroyed during World War II. These two structures in high sight are also very important for ASP because UPASP program actually conducted uh, the major, uh, I think this is the first archaeological dig on Portavaga Gate and what is now the Ermita de Portavaga, I think 2001 or 2002. And so far, three of our colleagues have already made researches or their theses. As far as I know, the late Tony Nazareno has a master of thesis on these, my good friend Carlos Tatel, and I believe Nico is studying right now the Chinese porcelain found in this particular site. So this is a place that is very close to UPASP. Now, going back to our topic, whether it came miraculously or through the usual trade path, its exact origins as an artifact remains a question. Did it come from Spain? Is it the work of a Latin American artist? or possibly Filipino. Scholar Regalado Trota Jose and Maita Reyes, the one who restored the painting, believe that the painting more likely is Spanish. Personally, I am more inclined to support the hypothesis that this is indeed a Spanish painting, for it fits the template of the approved Madrid school, and all the details are there. What you're seeing in the screen right now is the image without its accessories. And you could see that it's badly damaged because this was in 1984, after the theft. It was stolen and later on it was retrieved and it was already damaged around that time. You will notice the simplicity and intimacy of the composition. It's very madrilenia. And it reminds us of pattern D, the one with curtains, the one that's very simple, its size and its details are very faithful, faithful to the La Victoria canon. So even the very Western play of light and shadow seems to point to its Castilian origins. So I think this becomes more convincing if we try to see it in its restored format, so, because you will see the details more. So this is the product of the restoration of 1984, 85, if I'm not mistaken. You will notice here that there are actually colors when you clean it. We can see the details of the small painting. It's bluish. The outline of the statue, the statue is so becerra. And the Virgin herself is very classical beluto. Very simple, no decorative, decorative stuff in her robes. Even the furnishings are very minimal. And please take note, if you look at her, the feet, no? she's kneeling. Since they cannot put the cross in the small painting, they just added the nails and the crown of thorns at the bottom so that at least there is um, some sort of a reference to Good Friday. Okay? Now, of course, that is the Porta Vaga as an artwork. But you must understand that devotees do not go to Cavite to see it in a, mu in a museum. They see it as a supernatural representation of the Mother of God. 
And since the Soledad de Portavaga's fame rests more in its miraculous reputation, the pitcher becomes the vessel on which devotees express their love and gratefulness through precious gifts, what we call ex votos. You will see in the picture how a picture, a simple canvas, was suddenly turned into a kind of very ornate piece of art. Gold and silver pilgrims and jewelries of the devotees are melted to emphasize her features. Her head is framed with a golden sunburst. You will notice her rosary is now turned into diamonds. And many people would consider this as what we call the aesthetics of clutter, which means that the more famous an image is for miracles and what have you, the people are more convinced that they should give something precious to themselves, uh, to the image. And so the image changes because there are so many gifts and she has to wear all of them, etc. You know, what's interesting about this photo will be the ex votos. If you look on those stuff, you will see those are actually legs and feet and what have you, eyes. You know what's interesting? Those are ex votos. If you were healed in a particular part of the body, you attach a silver or gold leg, feet, eyes, whatever part of your body was healed, and you give it to the Virgin Mary as an offering. So I, unfortunately, I cannot locate that photo, but there is an old photograph of the Portavaga that is literally filled with those kinds of gifts, rings, wedding rings, and what have you. Everything is embedded in her picture. That is what we call the aesthetics of clutter. Now, please take note. The aesthetics of clutter is not one, a one-time makeover. The priest would say, Sige, pagandahin natin siya. So, i-makeover natin siya. No, it's not like that. It is something that is organic. It must happen through the wrong process of devotion. And it is a process primarily of accumulation. So, you really don't know how the Virgin Mary would look like in the future because it keeps on changing depending on the fortunes, misfortunes and whatever of Cavite and the rest of the province. So this comes to a point that some images are no longer recognizable because of this alteration due to accumulation. And this is primarily true with another very popular image, Our Lady of the Rosary in Manawag, Pangasinan. When a devotee goes and makes on pilgrimages, she would not see the, the original canvas painting. She would not think, oh, this is a Becerra painting, no. What she will see is actually the one simple, you know, painting, but now highly stylized because of all this pious clutter. What you see in the screen now is the Soledad de Portavaga at the height of her glory. Those filigrees and those decorations are mostly melted gold and silver which came from those people who made a lot of money from the galleon trade. So this can be jewelries and what have you that are melted so that you could create all of these wonderful jewels. Unfortunately, all of them were stolen. So the ones they have now will be a new set. So what was once a mere copy has become a variant. So this kind of stuff will remain embedded in the minds of the people and they bring this image at home. So they will not remember the simple Portavaga. They will remember the Portavaga that with the jewels, with the angels, with the candles, with, and what have you. And thus, when they create copies, they would remember the altered version and not how it looked like originally. You know, they are not purists. And this is popular piety at its best. So now the copy becomes the prototype of a new artistic tradition. Now, it seems that as early as the 1690s, the cult of the Nuestra Señora de la Soledad de Portabaga has achieved a level of autonomy divorced from the Madrid convent. Now, the devotion of the Cabiteños demands something tangible. They have to bring her to their homes. So the first type, you have estampitas and novena illustrations. Uh, these are for the masses. Novenas are open handy. They are small enough to be carried anywhere. Probably the cheapest way to spread the devotion and to create these artistic uh, copies. The second one, and probably 
one that I see more in the houses in Cavite City are estampas or prints, whether in paper or the more expensive ones in textile. For those who can afford, estampas or prints on paper will do. These were prints on, there were also prints on textile during the 18th to 19th centuries, particularly silk. Uh, what you see here to your left is an engraving in silk. It has deteriorated, but later on we will go back to that in its restored form. This other one is from General Trias Cavite, and you could see that it seems to be a lithograph of sorts or a print. Now, this is quite common in Cavite City. The old families still have copies of this, and they frame it. Now, if you are a rich kid and you have lots of money to throw away, then you choose this, embroidered and embellished prints. And I want to add, some of, some of them are almost like semi-sculptures or body leaves. For those who have money to throw away, these very expensive embroidered or embellished pictures are very, very popular. In fact, one will get the impression that these specimens are more grandiose than the actual Portabaga in the Hermitage. I mean, they outdid the one that is in Cavite. The one to your left is actually the one with metal embellishments, is actually owned by, formerly owned by Julian Felipe, the um, composer of the national anthem of the country. And the one to your right is a gold thread and ivory and song, which used to be with uh, the late Manolin Morato. I don't know who's the owner of that. And so these are very, very expensive stuff. So you will notice that the vast majority of copies are either two-dimensional or semi-two-dimensional, meaning body leaves. But for a time, they also have statuettes. Now, I've heard, I think it's Mr. Gigawin whom I heard that he, he calls this his favorite shape of the Virgin Mary. It's shaped like a pear. Some people say, parang baliktad na manga, etc. But it's a pear that is very, very exaggerated. You know, and this is obviously for the masses. This is in wood. And this is obviously something not for church use, but for home altar use. And honestly, I, I honestly like this stuff. Some people would say, but I find it very cute. Actually, the last time I saw one in person was at the San Ignacio Museum in Intramuros. They have one on display and it's almost like primitivist. Now, the one to your right is actually from copies, although it is claimed that it also came from Cavite. No? But let's proceed now with five masterpieces of the Philippine school that I am proposing. Oh, I'm sorry. Six masterpieces of the Philippine school. What you see now is the Jesuit College Estampa. It's very probable that there are pictures which are actually earlier than this, but this is the one that actually became most reproduced. So this estampa used to belong to the Jesuit college in Cavite um, before they were expelled. Remember, the Jesuits were expelled from the Spanish Empire, so they left. Uh, but later on, they were able to get hold of this again, and the Jesuits gave it uh, and eventually gave it to Cavite, and eventually it's now enshrined at the Tahana ng Mabuting Pastor, I believe in its um, restored form. And you will notice that this one is quite important because it heralds the start of an entirely new way of depicting the Soledad. The Holy Spirit has now entered the picture. You will see that on top. There are more instruments of the passion, including whips, cords, pincers, hammers. Take note, the Virgin is kneeling and praying, but you could see she's no longer kneeling on the floor. She's kneeling on a very fluffy cushion or pillow. The candles suddenly disappeared and dominating the lower part of the image, you can see there a galleon and the high seas. You could see the high seas there, no? An obvious reference to the port of Cavite and the icon's role in the Manila galleon trade. It is a well-known fact that the icon was used to bless galleons bound for Mexico and so now you understand why I called 
this talk or entitled this talk, The Widow of the Gallions. The banner or the blurb that you see at the bottom describes the picture as that of Nuestra Señora de la Soledad de Portabaga, not La Victoria, not a single mention of the ones in Madrid. The artist even enumerates all the spiritual benefits and indulgences that a devotee can get by praying in front of this print, courtesy of the Archbishop of Manila and the Bishop of Cebu. This masterpiece from a novena, which is kept at the University of Santo Tomas archives, okay, is practically similar to the first one. The face of the Virgin looks more realistic. However, you could see her shape, mas masyadong exaggerated, yung exaggerated and large her shape. So its outline is over the top. It is more simple, however, compared to the previous specimen. But I want you to look at the, the dark, this lower portion. You will see that the lower portion is an exact copy of the print that I showed you previously. And even up to the V-shaped motif. Now, for those people who knew it, because I'm honestly at a loss, what is this V-shape, which always appears in her image, kindly do so, so that I could correct or rectify my error, etc., etc. You will see also a description of the Virgin at the bottom. And the description is primarily on Portavaga, on Cavite, and all related churches at that. Okay? Slide 27 is something that I find very beautiful. This specimen from Nueva Ecija is basically number one and two in full color. And boy, is she beautiful. By the 19th century, colored prints and paintings like this are already affordable or can be, you know, they're readily accessible. This one is very gaudy, almost cheerful. The melancholic shadow that characterizes the original and the Portavaga suddenly disappeared. And you are seeing a tableau as if it is in broad daylight. Filipinos have this sense of horror vacui, a fear of space. So where there is negative space, Filipinos have the itch of decorating every nook and cranny of it. So you could see now that the Virgin suddenly wears stars, the angels became golden, and you, you know her crown looks very, very different. Okay, almost reminiscent of the Philippine crown. And take note of that. Look at the frame. The frame is very charming. And when you look closely at these symbols, you actually have holy week symbols scattered all over the place, almost in random, from the rooster of St. Peter up to the picture of the, you know, for the Last Supper and what have you. We have all the other instruments of the passion. But at the top, you have here something very important. You have the empty cross. Remember that? The soledad is a soledad because it's meditating on the cross of Christ who has not yet risen from the dead at that time. So this is a very beautiful sample. Closer to home, you have Nuestra Señora de la Camba, which is one of the most unique specimens of the school. Here, the original reproduction is totally covered in either textile and metal embellishments what we call risas. Now, what makes this unusual? There's virtually no perspective in this picture. It is flat and it is like floating in the air. The Virgin herself is ornamented. You can see um, there's the Virgin, no? She's ornamented, but they added jewels. You have a rosary here. You have a golden heart with a sword, etc. And these are add-ons. So the Virgin has all the major elements of the estampa. Curtains, galleons, the instruments of the passion. The angels are here, but in a different order. And um, in general, the impression is that you have a virgin that is very, very pear-shaped. Okay? And then all of these symbols are just floating around as if defying gravity. Some people say, this is not a masterpiece. I mean, this is just like the work of a child. In fairness, I like it. The more childish it is, the more you know charming it is, okay, among the Philippine Soledads. Now, it might be of interest to the listener to know that Camba Street between Binondo and Tondo 
in the mid-19th century was home to a very large community of Chabacano and Caviteño migrants. Even though there, uh, there are very, very famous virgins in Manila, they prefer to bring their Holy Mother with them. So wherever the Caviteños come, they bring the Caviteña Virgin with them, even in the big city. It's an emblem of their identity. Going to Buhi, Camarines Sur, uh, this is the Soledad de Buhi, which for me strikes me as very, very Filipino. The colors are very solid, very loud, very bright. The sculptor has to choose from a wide array of decorative elements because the wooden panel cannot accommodate all the details. Now, the background and foreground are simpler than the prints. If not for the galleon, if not for the galleon, the pincer and the hammers at the bottom, actually, this will be a very simple barili. And yet, with all the simplicity of the background, the artist did very differently with the Virgin. Her immaculate heart is, look at that, very red. And then you have seven daggers, uh, a motif that was borrowed from the Virgen de los Dolores. Her robes are now gilded, and now she has even two uh, a sash with golden tassels. And what you have there is a rosary with what seems to be a medal. This is unconventional. But you know the most important part? She's not kneeling. She is actually stand, standing up. How do I know if she's standing up? When you look at the lower parts of her body, her feet is actually represented. Her bare feet. So she is not praying, kneeling. She is actually standing in a standing position. And that alone is a very nice innovation on the part of the um, Bicolano artist. Now, I purposely want to end with this last masterpiece. The last piece is from a private collection that was auctioned by um, Leon Gallery last 2017. Definitely not my collection because I don't have money to buy these things. But I included it because, what can I say? This is simply awesome. I decided to place this at the end to show to you how far has the Soledad iconography evolved through two centuries. There is a certain balance and maturity in this small piece that I can say is truly Filipino. If you look closely at this box frame, the Virgin is very pear-shaped, almost like, not pear, almost like a mango, and then heavily embroidered. Horror vacui, that's very Filipino. Ivory head and hands, that's so Hispano-Filipino, and you have this ivory parts, probably done by Chinese artisans. The essential curtains are there, and they are very realistic. The candles, are now in pure silver and that the galleon look at the galleon is not now hovering beside the virgin she is not the you know the, the galleon is not floating the galleon is flying in the air and you will notice this there is not a single reference or symbol on the passion of christ none this is a happy picture this is a happy lonely happy soledad who is supposedly lonely now the cross or any hint of good friday is gone so the virgin is now meditating on the so-called galleon and you know the background reminds me so much of the altars at santo domingo now whoever owns this piece of, is a very lucky guy because i see in this piece the full maturity of the philippine school of the soledad tradition now as a conclusion, there are many ways of seeing the Porta Vaga painting. Now, as an artist myself, I see it as an important turning point in Hispanic and Philippine art history. Why do I think so? Number one, first, it is a noteworthy specimen of the Madrid School of Soledad Pictures. So as a copy, I think that has reached so far, I think that will be very, very relevant for Spanish art history. Second, popular devotion and artistic appreciation of the Cavite painting developed organically without any reference to the official cult in Madrid. Again, no matter how the 
authorities try to police this devotion, you cannot take away the fact that people would interpret it in specific ways that they wanted to because that is the dynamic of popular devotion. It is devotion or piety from below rather from above. Third, the Soledad de Portavaga, altered by pious aesthetic clutter, heralded the start of an entirely new artistic tradition, which I can personally say is truly Hispano-Filipino. And since it is the fiesta right now, although it's signal number three, I can say that these are three reasons why the more we should celebrate the feast of the widow of the galleons. P.S. Um, the lecture owes a lot from this particular sources. If you are interested in starting to know more about the Soledad icon, you can utilize these sources, but I would recommend something as a starter. Please look for La Virgen de Luto by Eduardo Merino. That is a very nice book. It's the most recent study so far. Of course, I had to thank the Cofradia de Nuestra Señora de Soledad de Portavaga. I know, I don't know if Father Vir is here. Thank you very much for allowing me to utilize these particular photos. If ever I fail to ask permission, at least um, I put your names here and the slides in which they are used. And I would like to thank these people who are very nice enough to give me advice and for helping me to bring about this online lecture. Maraming salamat po sa inyo at magandang tanghali po sa inyong lahat. Thank you very much, Elaine. All right. That was a very good talk. I Thank really you. liked it. Okay. Uh, I think that there's a lot of questions um, and we're, I, I've been discussing with other people at the background while you were actually lecturing. So maybe I can start so if any, anyone has any questions you can put it on the on the chat box uh or you can private message me or ara whose username is espgar and or amspgar or you can raise your hand all right but i will start with a question Aline. that was a very fantastic talk so first of all what can, can you I, maybe i missed this so is there a is there a time for the earliest print? What was the early, what was the time again for the earliest print? The earliest recorded one, at least, uh, was sometime in the late 1700s. No? But I feel that those are just copies of earlier ones. Uh, as far as I know, I don't know if Ian is in the house. Um, they say that there are others possibly in the UST archives. So, um, if the ones that are supposed to be earliest are just copies, so it's very likely there are even earlier ones waiting to be discovered. Um, I think I would leave that. The Cofradia de Nuestra Señora de la Soledad, some of them are actually in the house right now, is, I, I think they have a project wherein they catalog many of the stuff. I do hope if they do have information about that, they're more than willing to include that in our future research. No? But I think UST Dub might have one. Okay, I don't know in Cavite City. Um, remember, Cavite City was also destroyed during the war. So, but there are some who probably kept it. I, I am so, very sure about that. So, uh, oh, uh, oh, okay. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sige, Anna. But in uh, Cavite, they were also. Ah, sorry. So in Cavite, they were there. Do you think that there's a group that still continues to to uh, wor worship? No, no, not worship. Guess, venerate, venerate. Okay. To, uh, yeah, venerate. Yeah, 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 yeah. Sorry. Okay, venerate this this uh, statue, or do they? Because it became such a ha famous household, ano, di ba, yes, icon. Yes, yes. So I'm at nag, the fact that nag, nagawagawa nagawa sila ng mga mga, cop ng mga mm -hmm. uh, on the copies. So it it was ano was it intentional ginawa ba siya tas binenta or was it of course, the people um, who were asking yung, yung, for yung it yung mga copies nila definitely kahit maliit yan na bin, binebenta din yan of course it's very similar to what we have now no kung meron kung gusto mong syempre uh, nothing is for free of course there are some which are for free 
if there are pious organizations that do that, no? The paintings definitely medyo ibang level na yon. You have to pay the artists for for the effort. Prints, however, yung mga engravings yon na ipagbibili nila. But um, in general, there are specific prints in the 19th, particularly 19th century, because what's interesting about the Porta Vaga is that it actually peaked in the 19th century. So 1600s, 1700s, 1800s, nag-grow siya. And then, nawala na yung galleons, medyo nag-slow down, and then nag-peak at the time when the, you know, the illustrados are entering the picture, etc., etc. And people can afford all of these stuff. So, depende sa class ng tao. Kung tayo ay masa, siguro I would opt for the cheaper ones, yung mga papel, prints, etc. Kung mayaman, it definitely yung mga magaganda. Although, one thing I've noticed in Cavite, no, uh, and this is the one that I really sana ma-document, and I, I do, nag-document naman sila sa Cavite, no? uh, particularly Cavite City, usong-uso yung mga lumang prints, you know, pictures, lumang prints, tapos ang ginagawa nila, they paste it on a board or a piece of cloth and then they embroidered on it. Or if they cannot embroider, they put um, materials, parang mga sequins and what have you, and they create some sort of a mosaic out of an existing picture. Uh, in fact, one writer, Consuelo Estefa, is the one who noticed that I think of all the devotions in the Philippines, it's the Cavite one, which for some reason sparks artistic versions. I would not be surprised because it is a two-dimensional thing. It's a painting. So you can, it's not like, you know, statues are expensive. But paintings, you know, I can draw, etc., etc., have it framed and show it there. So there is creativity involved. In fact, just recently sa Facebook, nakita pa ako ng chibi version, ni anime version pa nga. Of course, people might have opinions regarding that. But that is a continuity of its dynamism. Nagbabago siya. And... Kasi kung nagbabago siya, ibig sabihin, there's a really, nagko-continue itong icons na to sa, yes, sa their, minds ng mga tao. Yes, yes, definitely. In fact, Cavite is a very devastated city. Tandaan mm -hmm. mo, it used to be a very prosperous town. Yes. Kumunta ng Cavite na iwanan ng Cavite City, which used to be the capital. Kami dito sa Rosario, may SM sila, wala. Mga ganun, you know, pinagaan, ah, nag-decline na kayo. But you see, the Caviteño Chabacano culture is a very proud culture. And although much of their material heritage has disappeared, there is one thing that's still very much there, and that is the icon. And they wouldn't give it up so easily. In fact, I saw one Caviteño Chabacano guy with a full tattoo of the Portabaga, yung boom frame, kasama yung, ano, ah, yung ornate frame, in, on his back. Wow. Some people would say, Nako, over the top devotion na to eh. But you see, it's very Mexican, parang Mexican. The yes. Guadalupe is not just a religious symbol, it has become a symbol of your own identity. In fact, what I've noticed about this is the fact that um, there are so many tattoo houses in Cavite City. Even in Manila, I saw one, na meron silang tattoo template ng Portavaga for the arm. So, this is something very, very interesting. Okay. Uh, there are some questions here from other people. I, I have more questions, but there are, there's already a lot of questions. Um, Dr. Barreto Tesoro was saying that uh, this can be discussed from another perspective, uh, which is the indigenous, uh, uh, the local Filipinos perspective. Mm -hmm. So I guess that's another thing that you can tackle mm -hmm. in the future. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, Yada San Andres uh, it has a question. So this has, she says, this has more to do with Latin America, but the project on the engraved sources of Spanish colonial art or pesca in UC Davis is also a great resource for Spanish colonial sacred art. Um, yeah, yeah, I, uh, yeah, that's a very nice resource. In okay. fact, I saw that particular, uh, it's very nice. And it must extensive yung collection. Okay. Thank you very much, Jada. Okay. And M Ms. Belen, MLS Belen says, Hello and thank you for this talk. I may have not heard correctly what was mentioned earlier, but did you mention the Habsburg? And if it is, were you referring to the House of Austria? Yes, the, Span the Spanish it's, branch of the House yeah. of Austria. Ah, okay. The one that became and, extinct. You know, the one famous for their jaws. Yes. <laughs> the, and I think uh, Grace knows this a lot because 
So because she has a uh, a lot of readings about the Habsburgs and the yes, ba- yes, Brandbergs. Yes. Okay. Mm-hmm. Mercy Candelaria asks, so thank you, sir, for this very informative webinar about Our Lady of Portavaga. I hope that this devotion will prosper more here in Cavite, like the devotion to Our Lady of Peña Francia in Naga City, so that the next generation will be able to be devoted even more to Our Lady mm-hmm. of Portavaga, especially the youth today. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think there are many young people who are, actually, I've noticed that the ones who are at the helm of the social media presence of the Sudedad are very young mm-hmm. people. So I think you're, and you're, it's in good hands. I have a question though. So, uh, so for the import, it looks like there are some. You were mentioning that there were some parts of the icons that continue. That there's some continuity. Parang mawala ng lahat, wag lang ito. So there's the tama ba ako? The clothes, the candle. Balik ako don. Uh, gusto mo balik ako don sa ano? Yes, please. Uh, sige, sige. Yes, if you can. Okay. Kasi interesting siya na bakit yun yung nagko-continue. And even here in the Philippines, lalo na sa Indi- I- I'm thinking about it sa indigenous perspective, sa local perspectives. Mm-hmm. Anong Why? gusto mo yung ano, yung yung mga local versions? Kung pwede o Oo, yung patatayo sa local versions. Yes, please. Nag Eto to to. Yung, yeah. Yeah, yung yes, local version. Yes. Sige, sige. So, pag titignan natin yung mga Ay. parang nag... Kailangan? Oh, no, no problem. Sa... Okay. Mm... Okay. Oh, yan. Yan sa first. Yan, sige. Alright. So, yan. So, yung mga clothes, at least yung clothes ay actually, of course, the head tilt, and uh, mm. the head is tilted always to the left. Yes. The Although there may mga nakakal yun nga sayang no, hindi ko nakuha. May mga iba nakakalusot sa other side. Ah, okay. Oh, may mga ganoon. Okay. No, mas mahal yon din. Ano, malis eh, di ba? Okay. Uh-oh. So that's one. Mm. But do the people know the meaning of this when you're when you're an artist or is it uh, kinikwento ba yan sa sa veneration of Portavaga na ito ah, kailangan naka-tilt sa right, ganyan. Or, kasi immediately, may mga different icons na, na nakikita eh. So, but mm-hmm. that could, that stays the same. Mm-hmm. Kasi ang, uh, ito ah, the way I see it, um, I was talking to the foremost historian of this particular uh, devotion, uh, Father mm-hmm. Vir, who is actually just on the other side of the river here, no? Literally, um, nag-uusap kami regarding this and sabi ko, uh, is, there are actually two ways. Hindi ko sinama dito yung Nuestra Senora de la Soledad na pang Bierne Santo ang paglabas sa mga simbahan because there are mannequin style uh, Soledads. Mm-hmm. But they are not as popular as the one that is on the two-dimensional figure. So, for some reason, ang pumatok talaga sa devotees will be the two-dimensional one. And I would understand because the Cavite icon is a painting and they cannot imagine it otherwise than a painting. As a 3D. Or a pin- or as 3D. Mm-hmm. Pero mm-hmm. Meron, meron sila, may mga Nuestra Senora de la Soledad in the Philippines, pero they no longer follow this particular uh, model, no? Mm-hmm. They are like Mater Dolorosas. Uh, and you will be surprised, no? Um, kasi dati hindi ko naman alam ang mga difference niyan. Basta alam ko, dati sila umiiyak na Virgin Mary. Iba pa pala yung umiiyak na sobrang iyak, we call it an angustia. Pag umiiyak na medyo dramatic is a Dolores. Pag umiiyak pero may hope na that is an esperanza, may mga ganun pa sila. So pag konti iyak lang pero hindi tumutulo masyado dahil medyo meditative, it's soledad. And I was surprised, meron palang ganun ano. Meron palang gradation of tears. So siguro next time pag-aralan natin yun. Because it's oh a very my. interesting. It's a very... And now I understand why there is so why Mexican telenovelas and Philippine telenovelas are the same, no? With melodramatic, there's an emphasis on anguish and sadness and what have you. And mm-hmm. but the one in Soledad, hindi masyado, no? It's mm-hmm. suppo- in fact, nagde-debate yung ibang mga pari dito. Hindi daw yan si Mary 
although alam naman natin ang tunay na story. Uh, some of people even misinterpret the image as Mary, the younger Mary, kasi she doesn't look old in the icon. Eh. She looks young. Mm-hmm. And dahil nga yung tiyan niya malaki, no, yung lower body, kaya yan malaki because she's wearing 16th century clothing. So may yes. mga matigas yung mga skirt nila. So may mga kumakalat na mga, you know, yung mga anecdotes na, no, actually, it's Mary nung buntis siya. Perfect! Ah, that's beautiful. Okay. Galing! But of course, sasabihin ko, kung buntis siya, bakit meron ng crown of thorns? Okay. Now, I don't know. But nag-aaw, syempre, alam naman natin ang pinagmunan. Ako, I'm definitely, I know that hindi siya buntis dyan. Mm-hmm. But some people even assume that she seems to be happy. Mm-hmm. And, she, and dahil nga ang Filipino representation at times are no longer in black. May mga stars na may mm-hmm. nakangiti na. I saw even, even in Peru, I saw one na naka, naka, nakangiti. No? Nakangiti na, so, pero... Nakangiti na, happy na siya. So, iba na yung context. Pero, pa, makita mo yung title, so, dad pa rin. So, alam pero mo itong, na it should be sad. Okay. This, this interpretation na pagiging buntis niya, it's not just found in the Philippines. It, it's also interpreted sa ibang... Uh, I have, uh, uh, meron na ko nakita na ganun, pero in the Philippines, dito ko lang narinig sa ilang mga... Ah, uh, uh, that's beautiful. Interesting, but I'm not saying na it's it's hindi siya buntis po. Talaga oh. ano siya? Oh. Widow po siya. Okay. Oh, ang ganda. Um, I have other questions, but I think there's another question from here. Um, from Carlos Earl Andres Mendoza. Mm-hmm. Uh, his question is: What artistic traits of the Vir- Virgen de la Soledad is unique only in our country, the Philippines? Unique in our country, in the Philippines. Okay. Mm-hmm. There is, you know, the galleon. That's why I'm always saying for the widow of the galleons, we are the only country that associates it with the sea and ships. Uh, I do remember when I presented an earlier version of this uh, there at UP, yan sa UP Diliman, last December, Penel mm-hmm. was asking, um, why is there a galleon there? Parang napaka random but then again that is the uniqueness no since it was found in the context of a port city which is involved in the trade definitely that environment will eventually find its way in the iconography so a unique element will be the galleon that's one second would be the waves of the sea and uh, mapakita sa ilalim no may waves uh, although may option ka na wag nung isama yon. Uh, third, I think the pillow is unique. Uh, so far, I haven't seen Latin American soledads on pillows. Pero sa mm. Philippines naka pillow siya. So in fact, may yeah. So pillows, um, oh. the seas, uh, ano pa? Itong how do you call this? Itong, um, itong galleons. Okay. Uh-huh. So that's yung three. Holy Spirit, yung One Holy list. Spirit meron din sa Mexico. Eh. Okay. Tsaka sa ibang lugar. Yung mga stars, stars, meron din sa Guatemala. Okay. The so st- in in that aspect, medyo consistent sila. So are you referring to the the stars in the at, on the head? No, the stars on the robes. Ah, okay. Kasi diba she's not supposed to be ornamented kasi naglulugsa. Yes. It's supposed to be dignified and simple, black and white. But you know, in Latin America, in the Philippines, lagyan natin ng ano, mga star stars. Mm-hmm. Ganun, okay? So, when you look at, ito, wala pa, oh. Mm-hmm. Kasi UST, probably, kung merong pare ang gumawa nito, medyo alam nila yung konteksto ng theology nito. So, they wouldn't mm-hmm. put much decoration here. Pero ito, mm-hmm. ibang level na. Mm-hmm. Yes. So, yeah, definitely, ba? Yeah. I was actually mentioning kay uh, Grace, Dr. Grace Barreto Tesoro dito, na medyo iba yung nakikita kong Icon. So until you pointed it out, what the materials are, iba yung interpretation ko. Mm-hmm. So kaya na na interes ako. So maybe that can be something that I I ako siyang sabihin kasi baka baka makita niyo baka ba ano ano ba ano ba isip <laughs> niya na iba iba yung nakikita ko. <laughs> Pero, as for the the crowns on the head, ano? The, the, ito, ito rin ay 
nasa ibang areas, di ba? No, I yung crown? Right. Yes. Definite, uh, the original context is wala siyang crown. Because mm -hmm. she's not supposed to be a anyway. well, she's supposed to be a mem. It's uh, you are actually getting rid of the the so-called um vanity of sorts. Because mm -hmm. there was an abuse of that in on Spain, so they want to curtail that cult. So medyo iwas iwas sa mga corona, pero later on nakakalusot din eh. In the case of the Virgin of Portavaga, yung corona you have to kasi una una pag naglagay ka pa ng corona jan, tapos meron dito yung mga halo na yon yun naka parang rostridyo na naka ikut don sa ano niya parang awkward na pinalagyan mo pa ng corona so that's ready metal tapos talagyan mo ng corona don so what I've noticed with some with some is that ang corona nasa labas na ng picture so if you look closely dito sa kamba nilagay nila doon sa taas ano na sa taas yung corona maliit ngayon if it is something that came from a donation, talagang corona na medyo malaki, you know what they do? Nilalagay nila sa taas ng frame or mm -hmm. sa gitna ng taas ng frame. Now, hindi mm -hmm. ko nga pala na, ano, one thing that is very Filipino, I don't know if they're also doing it in Latin America, um, ipipilit nila na kahit two-dimensional yan, dapat may damit pa rin na maaamoy at mahalikan. Of course, you cannot do that during the pandemic. No? Mm -hmm. Pero, paano mo gagawin yan in an icon that is flat. Alam nyo ginagawa nila, and this is the tradition oh. icon in the Philippines, yung icon, flat, yung yes. likod, yun ang pagkakataon nila para magkaroon ng damit na textile. So, gagawa sila ng parang mantel or veil, doon nila ilalagay sa likod para at least may damit pa rin siya. You got my point? Kasi ah. hindi mo pwede yung damit. You got my point? So, yung yes. picture, magmumuka siyang three-dimensional pag nakatalikod na kasi mayroong visage ng mantel na triangular. Mm -hmm. And you can extend it kasi nasanay ang you know, Filipinos before the Spaniards came, yung mga ating mga likha and anitos, yes. they are three-dimensional. Yes. So, syempre, of gusto course. natin yung mga gusto natin yung mga nahahawakan na 3D. Oh, Ayaw oh, natin oh, ang oh. flat. So, oh, ang oh. ginagawa natin, pinepwersa natin ang 2D na maging 3D. Of course, we respect the icon, it's flat. Pero yung mm -hmm. likod niyan, normally nilalagyan nila ng mantel. To give it to that it is actually addressed Madonna. Oh, just so, like what we normally see. Dinadamitan pa rin. Dinadamitan pa rin. Ang galing. Yung likod. Oh, pero sa concept nila, ano, dinadamit pa rin. Uh, at ang ganda, kasi yun. continuous, it, it leads back doon sa isa kong question, ng the importance mm -hmm. of the clothes. The um, textile. The textiles. Yes. Kasi mukhang doon nagmalaki yung variation din, but it stays the same as an icon. Mm -mm, um, mm -mm. um, before I go through that, see, Jack Medrana has a men mentioned, uh, gave a comment, several of our imagines have narratives that they were found in the water, also in Pakil, in Laguna, Landayan, from Lolo Uweng, SP Laguna, and others. So I guess there's a continuity in the importance yes. of water. You know, I asked Father Mendoza regarding this. Was there really an investigation regarding the so-called apparition and discovery? And they mm -hmm. said it's an oral tradition. It's a legend. Now, Galing. even if it is an oral tradition, though, I have to be very clear with this. Oral traditions also are archetypal. They show mm -hmm. a certain pattern of stuff. If you view it, sayang wala si Vito. Vito kasi, di ba, his first research is on the sacred feminine. They've mm -hmm. noticed that all these images are normally found in geographies that has something to uh, that geographies that are associated with motherhood, water, wells, mm -hmm. caves, like womb-like stuff. Mm. So if you view it from the feminine point of view, it's like the sacred mother entering the picture mysteriously. But this is the Philippines, the Philippines, or also the even in the, the Philippines, okay. even so in ano, all, even in uh, Latin in Spain, America. even in Spain, oh, okay. even Spain. in Latin America, consistent. Kaya it's also very hard to know if the story is authentic or is the story part of the natural development ah. of oral traditions that mm -hmm. are very consistent from Spain to the Philippines. Mm -hmm. Well, for for me, hindi naman uh, mag ang maganda jan is. Uh, the, even if hindi siya uh, 
hindi siya yung sinasabi nating authentic na nagpa, the fact na nasa back of our minds or nagpapatuloy pa rin siya na may continuity pa rin yung per, 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 may yung pervasive na icons or mga materials na ito sa sa ng mga pictures or sa sa statues so malaking mm -hmm. thing na yan um, actually ana yung oral tradition is mm -hmm. one that separates icons with popular devotion with icons that are simply sacred art with mm -hmm. icons that are simply like museum pieces mm -hmm. there is an oral tradition about that so for some skeptics would say oh we cannot prove it there are no archival yeah. documents about it but you see there's such a thing, according to Carl Jung, a psychological fact. It is a fact in your collective consciousness. So for the people in Cavite, they don't question that story. And that story becomes the norm, the fact, and it's a powerful story that is passed on consciously or unconsciously and influences their understanding of the icon to this day. Okay, very, that's a very good point. Um, before I go through that, see, uh, Dr. Can I call Dr. Barreto Tesoro to unmute because she has comments and questions. Yes, at the Grace. Hi, Elaine. Can Hello. You hear me? Yes, I can hear you, at the Grace. It's clear. Okay. Thank you very much for your talk. I enjoyed it. And Anna was mentioning that you were discussing in the background um, privately. Um, so, I think, yes, um, in honor of a multi-perspective scholarship, um, I think that uh, the data you presented can also be used to write another paper <laughs> from a <laughs> local perspective. Mm -hmm. um, we, we won't mention it, but Anna and I were seeing indigenous icons um, mm -hmm. or motifs, and they can be actually connected to uh, motifs found in archaeological sites. Yes. Um, you also mentioned that the Cavite heritage is no longer present. Uh, at least, I mean, uh, yes. physically, you cannot see that much because it was destroyed. Yes. But yes. they are still there. Remnants of it are still there. Yes. Um, so I believe you and support you in your statement that they are still there. And I personally think they are in the different um, artworks of the, of the Virgin um, that were produced uh, here in the Philippines. If you look mm -hmm. closely... Um, I think they're still in the Cavite um, households. Yes, yes. Yes, and in the in the in the paintings or works of art that you presented. Yes, yes, uh, yes. So before I go, one last question. One question. Uh, you mentioned that the crown was not an original um, mm -hmm. part of the painting. When was this? When was the first uh, image that uh, showed a crown, and where? Anywhere, okay. I don't know. Actually, I haven't really thought much of it. But what I do know is that the crown was never meant to be part of it. Yes. Um, of course, all the three major cults, I'm speaking of the three uh, recognized ones. Um, let me go back to, uh, to that slide. Eh? Uh, the three recognized versions, sorry. Um, well, anyway, the one in... Um, the one in Mexico, the one in Madrid, not the um, La Victoria, the one in um, La Paloma in Cavite are canonically recognized. So there's a crown there, but the idea of putting it on the actual image itself, medyo hindi tradition yon. Yeah. Um, kasi nga, parang do, for aesthetic purposes, meron, ang nagserserve na, na natural crown niya would be the ano yung sunburst na yun, na, na mapapansin mo alternate between a pointed stuff and a crisp like uh, motif which is consistent with that of uh, Madrid no yung crowns would be ang at least nakita ko at least when you look at the other traditions nagsimula mag-appear in some parts of Spain na malayo sa Madrid or di kaya hindi madrileño ang school am uh, for example, Andalusia. Um, there seems to be some na nilalagyan na nila ng corona. Um, it seems very consistent in um, Mexico. May corona na rin. But you must understand, in Mexico, um, where is that stuff? Okay. Um, when you see 
the Mexican version. Tingnan natin yun. Ito. Dito tayo pumunta kasi corona pinag-uusapan dito. Napasin nyo may corona na. But you must understand, yung ito napaka... This one in Oaxaca is entirely different. This is actually much earlier than than the Portavaga. This is around early 1600s, if I'm not mistaken. So, may corona siya because ang notion nila is pag three-dimensional siya, tat, hindi naman nila nilagyan ng stuff. Um, maganda na merong corona because he's a queen and, and they try to view it that way. Although, definitely, we need to do more research as to when talaga lumalabas ang corona. Although I've noticed they began to appear in Mexico and Guatemala, but in very rare cases. Um, itong Oaxaquenya, ito yung triangular na version na nakikita mo, Grace. Uh, ito, talagang image to, three-dimensional, and it always comes with a crown. So I am not at all surprised if they paint the solid that it's always with a crown. But in Cavite, uh, wag na natin pag-usapan yung canonical coronation, which is a very controversial issue, no? But ang ginagawa nila sa Cavite, imbis na yung crown na talaga, yung crown na royal, yung crown would be parang two-dimensional, parang body lift din. So, para bumagay siya doon sa stuff. But these are recent innovations. I don't know if in the private altars of Cavitenos and other collectors, if they do have crown images. Uh, I think there are more people who have more access to that. So, pahanap la cofradia de Soledad, some of them are actually uh, with us right now. Uh, I think they will be in the better position to pinpoint houses and, you know, private collections that have that. So, yun lang, Grace. Yeah, okay, thank you. Ay, Anna, one last, no? Yes, Ate Grace. Yeah, one, one more comment. Um, siguro, uh, in a separate paper, if Elaine wishes to do it, he can also look at uh, what was the, what were the events in the 19th century that led to the emergence or the rise of this uh, artworks in the 19th century. Because you mentioned na, na pero na, I don't know if I, there was a peak in that century. Yes, yes, yes. So it would be interesting to know what was the cause of the peak. Thank you very much. It was a very nice presentation. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Barreto. So I, I think, ma, take notes ka ba? <laughs> so, <laughs> Bagong project. Okay. Uh oh. No, may there's a question from the chat uh, from Rona Repansol. How do you distinguish if what is around the Virgin's face is a crown or a rostrillo? I just have an inkling that we may have been taking both alternatively. So mm -mm. okay. Kailan na mo na ng tubig. Okay. Take so, <laughs> okay. If it is technically rostrillos are not crowns, no. In fact. Um, if you look closely at those who are really very good, the mga santero, they even have what we call an aureola. And then you have, the way I understand it, the aureola is the one that is around the face. Mm -hmm. But it covers the whole face. The rostrillo is the one that is presented to be at the back of the head, like a halo. And some of them are even bigger, uh, which is a second halo that um, surrounds the crown. I'm sorry, I don't have pictures here. I might have misunderstood it, but you know, honestly, hindi ako masyadong particular with, you know, mga santero magagaling dyan. But as far as I understand, we, among the Porta Vaga here, um, if titinan ko dito yung Soledad, no? tinan natin kung the Mexican version, yung nakikita dito, as far as I know, the way they call it is the Aureola. And then, this halo, if there is a one that is around it and around and that this one will be rostridios and then you have the crown here so definitely the porta vaga given this context is not wearing a crown because it's meant to be light shining at the back of her head you know since it's almost two-dimensional it's not originally part of the picture or may dinadagdag nagmumukhang the face is actually beneath that uh, aureolar mm. or rostrillo, but actually it's meant to be behind. Yes. Uh, so, nagbib nagbabago rin yung dimension. Okay. And it's interesting. So, there's already a discussion here from uh, also from Arvin Orashon. So, 
for the Dolorosa Soledad or Soledad, the crown is called Resplendador, a common fixture uh, yeah. for the Soledad Dolores. Rostrino okay. is for a more glorious image such as the Pene Francia of Nicole. Hi, Hyun. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Now we know the difference. Yes. And Aurelia is the fixture usually placed at the back of the image, sometimes ah. on the shoulders for or like the for the Immaculada images. Okay, so, I, I'm really learning a lot. What's his name again? Arvin Orason is here. Arvin, so, uh, Arvin thank you very much. Uh. I, I'm not sure if you're familiar with each other, so I guess. Uh. <laughs> uh, yeah, Rosilio is full race. Resplendador is not full. Ah, so, so yeah, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, but for me, even then, the, the thing that because hindi we don't for when when you're talking about images, tapos tinatry mo siyang i i i uh, ipakita sa ibang mga sa mga usual mga, na mga tao yung mga gusto na mga gustong mga devotees, for example. Uh, Hindi naman iniisip siguro, ewan ko ah, hindi, I don't think iniisip ko immediately na crown ba to, resplendador ba to, basta meron lang siyang, it's just a, an icon. At dapat ito, like I said, yung ano yung mga important icons that continue. So it doesn't matter whether it's uh, it's a crown or a halo or something. Para, para lang sa image natin, meron lang, uh, meron lang dapat na pinaka-basic, pinaka-payak ng mga materyales hmm. na dapat uh -oh. na Actually, if you still remember the original spirit of the the, the Becerra statue, the original one which was destroyed, is mm -hmm. as much as possible they should move away from the tendency to dull it up. So, yung intention in Philip II, and you know, Philip II is such an obsessive compulsive man, he wanted to, you know, be uh, at the helm of everything. <laughs> so, they wanted. Um, in the Counter Reformation, they feel that the excessive dressing of the Virgin Mary is one of the fuels that, you know, it gives more fuel to the fire that already exists between Catholics and non Catholics. So it's like giving the Protestants and other uh, Christian groups more reason to actually say, as you see, you're dulling up your stuff. And so there are accusations already that it's bordering idolatry and what have you. So what they did is they tried to get rid of those decorations and what have you. Less emphasis on the honor, whether this is crowned or not. And just focus on the basic elements of what it should mean. It's the theological aspect rather than the visual aspect. But you must understand also that popular devotion has always been very tactile and visual. So now you can see the clash between the intellectual understanding of the icon and the emotive understanding of the icon based on the point of view of the devotee. Hello. <laughs> Hello, sorry. Oh, I, I was... Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Nawala yeah. yung ano ko. Yung <laughs> okay. aking mute button. Mm -hmm. uh, Akash, I, 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 Akash. Uh, Apakan na ito. Uh, Aline, sorry. I was already looking at the other pictures, at the other talks. Aline, uh, I think we can end this binalot for now, but if you're open for more uh, discussion, are you still free? And we can, you can have more discussions after, or if, if it's possible, can people email you? Yeah, yeah, no problem. Okay, okay. Uh, I'll just forward to you my email. Uh, yes. So that at least uh, the, those people who joined uh, can actually ask me questions. Ah. I'll be around. Nandyan sama sama lang naman tayo sa okay. community natin. Yes, and we can continue the 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 chica because uh, if you're still free, are you still free after? Sa, yeah, sa test pit ba yan? Uh, be, be, <laughs> meron pa akong questions dito that I want to, <laughs> to ask actually. Okay. Pero sige, sige, I think sige. we can look beyond the test pit. But uh, I will formally end <laughs> this and stop the recording. Right. Thank you very much, Elaine, for that very wonderful talk. That was really one of the best talks. Well, that was really a great talk. But uh, as usual, you really give a lot, very good talk. Um, for next week, I already mentioned his name. Uh, the guest will be uh, our. The speaker will be Akash Unibaj uh, from. 
I can't I can't pull up his the information, but he is his research will is entitled uh, variability of mode two technology: a reinvestigation into the implications of the Mobius line in a trillion like technologies of South East and Southeast Asia. So he is from uh, I E E S E R Mohali in India. So he is a PhD candidate. So see you again next week, hopefully, and keep safe, everyone. Uh, keep dry, and thank you for attending the Binalo Talks. And if you want to uh, continue asking questions, I, I will still be here for a few more minutes. Thank you.